Let's, what I'd like to talk about today, Kyle, is um, the um, the protocol. Um, first, the the logic of the protocol, and then I want to get into after the first break. I want to get into five five sins that 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 I see that are that are in cases of affliction, um, and that uh, you know uh, that we need to unflesh unfle- fle- out a little bit those five sins that I think are primary holding points, entry points, and holding points kind of work hand in hand, two sides of a coin, if you will. I'm going to give you two statements, uh, two or three statements. Number one, Father or more, every form of magic is practiced with recourse to Satan. So there's no such thing as white magic or black magic. Catechism 2114, idolatry consists in divinizing what is not God. Man commits idolatry whenever he honors and reveres a creature in the place of God, whether this be gods or demons, and in so doing rejects the lordship of God. And so we so I, I list off in the book from Father Bamonte, who was the former president of the International Association of Exorcists, um, everything from tarot cards, Ouija boards, uh, uh, um, any form of witchcraft, superstition, occult practices, being present at with psychics, fortune tellers, amulets, talismans, medium sorcerers, tarot card readers, witches, uh, having attempted these things, accompanies these things, uh, Reiki, uh, even transcendental meditation, certain forms, new age practices, spiritual cleansings, voodoo, uh, membership in secret societies, satanic groups. These are all violations of the first commandment. These are how of recourse to Satan. And the Satan, the Satan, I mean, the, the devil will take a, that as a permission to be there. Right. So um, he also at, lists alienate alienating vices, alcohol, abuse, drugs, sexual perversion, and blasphemy. So, so um, we see in the radical form violations of the first commandment as one of the most obvious entry points and holding points for the enemy. That's precisely right. And you use the term correctly, divination, and that is the um, attributing to something other than the one true God, um, something divine, something supernatural. Anytime you attribute any of that to creature uh, or the artifices or, uh, or accoutrement of a creature, then you've committed the sin of divination. Um, idolatry is another term. But now this is something that is interesting because of these transgressions, this is not a gradation. This is a mortal sin by incident, by its occurrence, not by its gradation. So technically, one could not, quote, dabble uh, in the occult or in divination because you, you either are or you're not. And so this is, there's no venial category for this. This is uh, it's grave matter by its simple occurrence. Yeah. So what I see, uh, what I see working cases as well is that you've got first commandment, sixth commandment, first commandment violation. Uh, these are these, this seems to be the one two knockout. As Father points out, Father Ripper points out that one mortal sin is sufficient for possession. But God is so merciful. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen that, um, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Oftentimes, it's that combination of the of some form of occult witchcraft and then some grave violation, deviant sexual behavior. So the first thing that I w- would say is the first entry point is that. But part of those alienating vices that Father Bamonte talks about, deviant sexual behavior. So talk about impurity and deviant sexual behavior as an entry point and a holding point for the evil one. So you use the term um, alienable offenses um, to alienate. And, and I think it's important. You're, it's very descriptive. But what it alienates or what it divides or what the dia- diabolic effect is, it's the, it is the separation of creature from creator at the will. And so the, will, the creature's will is now no longer joined to the will of the creator. And so there's – and he's alienated uh, from God the Father, from his creator. This will require reconciliation. This is not repairable except through a sacrament. And so this is very important to to realize is that it will require a sacrament, if not multiple sacraments, to and it, it, you can't repair the damage. It is a reconciliation. Um, you can address the sin. You can address the act. But this is what is so very, very important is when we want to distance ourselves from reality or from providence, we're rejecting God. Um, the demon certainly sees it this way. We may not. It, for us, it's an aversion to suffering. It's an aversion to vocation. It's an aversion to whatever it may be. Right. 
first first commandment transgression, like you say, but the one two punch is now he not only does he deny God, but he elevates himself and serves self. That's the sixth commandment violation, all the rest of those violations. He now has placed himself as God. So there's the one two punch is there is a denial and then there's a supplanting. And those are two different things. Yeah. So so uh, on impurity, um, St. Alphonsus calls uh, impurity and sexual deviancy hell's widest gate. And when you talk to priests today, they're, they're, they'll, they're not going to give you details of the confessional, but they will nod their heads. Um, and, and some priests, when you talk about the most common sin is impurity. And um, some priests have said is 80 percent of what they're hearing um, is uh, uh, in the confessional are sins of impurity. And these are these are Catholics trying to break free of that. So so the, the sexual deviancy is another huge one that's got to be addressed. You've got to get the sexuality completely under control. There's a lot of confusion out there. If you understand, uh, you talk about the, the Father Bamante uses the phrase alienating vices. That that word alienation is is very c- critical to understanding what sin does. I remember from my moral theology days uh, of studies that sin is a fourfold alienation, and all that needs to be restored. If we think about re- uh, the definition of liberation, is 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 reconciliation with God the Father through Jesus Christ, and and has to be in through the sacraments. So the first of, of the four alienations that take place is alienating us from God. Um, so we get alienated from God. We get alienated from others, right? We commit sin. We break our relationships and creates alienation with others. Uh, alienation from our even our own environments, our our, our 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 own activities in the world and society, and finally and ultimately alien not ultimately but ultimately with God, but with ourselves. So God, self, others, and our environment. That's the fourfold effect of sin and sexual deviancy. You see that. You see the effect of sexual deviancy. How it creates this this gap between you and yourself ultimately that restoration with God, the father sacramentally brings back all these areas into right order. And that is just, it, there's a lot of spade work and grunt work that needs to take place in the second phase to create that reconciliation post sacramental. Very, very well said. I think that one of the things that people lose sight of is that when you're alienated from God, when you're alienated from God, you're also alienated from the entire church triumphant, the entire heavenly host, all the angels, all the saints. You're, you're alienated. You're alienated from not only God, but all who serve God. So far, we've said the occult, any occult activity violation, the first commandment, the one, two punch, the second on the heels of that often is deviant sexual behavior. What St. Saint Alphonsus Liguori calls hell's widest gate uh, within that. Here's some other ancillary sins that come with that, according to uh, Gregory the Great. St. Gregory the Great says that when the general, he talks about the the the, the general, uh, each each of these major, uh, um, these, these devices uh, have, are generals, and they have other uh, so forces underneath them fighting. These are some of the companion vices that come with that, um, which are sins, by the way, going back to our last conversation. Blindness of mind thoughtlessness, inconsiderate towards others, inconstancy, inability to control emotions, thought in relation to the events of life, rashness, behaving too quickly or rashly without thinking, self-love, hatred of God, love of this world, affection for the present world, and attachment to worldly things and events, and abhorrence or despair of a future world, dread for the future, lack of hope, lack of hope in God. You see that we have the demon or the general of, of, of impurity, which Alphonsus calls the hell's widest gate. Now, uh, Gregory the Great says it has companion vices that come with that. And if you look at those companion vices, you're kind of describing this generation uh, in many ways. You, you, you certainly are. And, and I think that that's, um, if you look at some of Father Ripperger's talks on um, the sixth generation, the zeitgeist, you, you see how there are particular sins that, uh, that a generation may be more susceptible to. But at the end of the day, this, even, this offers even another layer of the, for an opportunity of, of sanctity to go counter culture, to go counter. Uh, when we talk about the demon being tertiary, the first one is the, the person, our own concupiscence, our own fallen nature. And then the world, the zeitgeist or the weakness of an age actually operates in those where those two meet. Um, 
is what are the the sins of a of a particular generation that we're blind to, that we're we're subject to fall to, that we're particularly vulnerable, and then look at how the world um, pushes those sins, if you will, or um, makes those sins culturally acceptable, fashionable, whatever you want to whatever you want to call it. Um, those two working in concert um, are particularly um, troublesome uh, is the i guess as good a word as any yeah here's one that here's one that surprises people sin number three unforgiveness um lack of forgiveness as i put this in the book is a major obex which burdens the soul and restricts the flow of grace a hardened unrepentance and failure to see your own faults is the first obex which must be removed and so oftentimes when we're dealing with cases uh you know we even put this in the book who are the three people that you find most hard to forgive because because we can we can undercover that we can start to discover the psychological traumas uh, past events that need to be integrated uh and, and and healed and through through redemptive suffering and sacramental reconciliation talk a little bit about unforgiveness and how that becomes a both an entry and a holding point a very good topic it, it it so we go to the our father first of all to see the operative theological principle forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us if we're not in the business of charity if we're not in the business of mercy then we can't expect it as a remuneration we can't respect it expect it coming to us if it's not coming from us or through us a uh, very simple metaphysical relationship um, we cannot confect grace we can merely convey grace um, and so one of the things I think that is a sobering statement when you make it to people they haven't they just don't think of it they don't um, think this way is if you are feeling the effects of a curse if you are feeling the effects of a curse the chances are 99 out of 100 that this is why there's an unforgiveness there's an animosity there is a held grudge there it, it doesn't have to be vicious it doesn't have to be active you don't have to be setting out to destroy the person but if there is a lack of charity toward any soul if you can't exchange the peace of christ with any human on the face of the earth then to that extent you are vulnerable to a curse um, the curse will have no effect on a holy man it, it doesn't mean that it won't have an effect on a mostly holy man the curse, everybody wants to break the curses that someone's sinning against them. Someone's cursed them, and they want to break the curse. That is not near as important as correcting the vulnerability. And 99 out of 100 vulnerabilities which allow a curse to be effective are some form of unforgiveness. Right. And this is why, uh, uh, you, you know, the light of Christ prayer is so important um, that you that 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 you wrote. It's a beautiful prayer. May the light of Christ be upon this person, that they see themselves as the heavenly father sees them. And I see him as the father sees him. You're inviting Christ into that construct to wash away with the light of truth, all the unforgiveness and all the misconceptions and in and, and distorted uh, um distorted perceptions the apathy uh, uh disappropriate emotions high, you know high inconstancy and emotionality bringing the light of christ in that scenario is very very important to to bring uh forgiveness of course and confessing that unforgiveness right confessing that unforgiveness is very important if you're only confessing the carnal things um and you're riddled with un unforgiveness that's a thought that's an evil thought too right so we have to confess the holding point of unforgiveness well said uh because it it is mostly in in most of the church goers those who participate in a sacramental life um most of the sins of unforgiveness are sins of thought uh they don't people don't act on them um there's not a tangible act but they're sins of thought and this is what blackens the heart this is what darkens the intellect this is what takes the joy out of uh, out of life and so a lot of obsession uh, i mean a lot of oppression begins with this uh this unforgiveness and it can be geared toward god it can be a sense of entitlement a sense of denial um but the, oftentimes we see this as the stepping off point if you will the deviation from the path of the straight and narrow uh the, the pursuit of the good this is often the first deviant step is to allow yourself to uh, harbor some unforgiveness some resentment then number four that comes on the heels of unforgiveness 
which is something that was also surprising uh, to many people that this is an entry, but also especially a holding point offensive against offenses against the truth and the sin of detraction. Um, you know, you've used the phrase, the devil looks for the mouth that blesses and curses. Explain about uh, the importance. And this is, I found, um, going to the catechism and using this as an examination of conscience, offenses against the truth, is a good preparation for the sacrament of penance. But explain explain a little bit more about the, the offenses against the truth as one of the holding points uh, uh, for the demon. So, the, yeah, this is, uh, this is an area that is extremely common. Most all of our cases have some element to this. Um, and what it amounts to is, is it is the confessing of, of the sins of others. Um, we do no good to confess the sins of others because if we confess the sins of others, it often blinds us to our own sin, our own culpability. But here's the real problem with Catholics, especially in this modern age, is that we have a higher responsibility. We have a higher obligation to the truth, the integrity of the truth, because for us, the truth, capital T, is a person. That is Jesus Christ. And so our relationship with the truth, just like our relationship with the Holy Ghost, the Blessed Mother, our relationship with these concepts and these people and these individuals is different than the rest of the world, the non-Catholic world, because they are personified for us. And so offenses against the truth, when we commit these, we scourge our Lord. We, we offend our Lord specifically. Now, here's the big departure point is that secularly, we're told that we can say anything, anytime to anybody if it is factually correct, if it is, quote, the truth. And that's a misuse of the word truth. But if it's factually correct, and this is, in fact, the um, the defense to slander, detraction, calumny, all these things can be defended modernly and secularly if they are factually correct. But we as Catholics are held to a much higher standard. The fact that it is factually correct does not mean that we should or could say it with impunity. Yeah, yeah, and no. so gossip. Yeah. Gossip, detraction, slander, this is a sin to which we are blind in the in the West, particularly in this country. No, absolutely. We, we see this even in, in Catholic media circles. You see just just broad uh, calumny, you know, like you like you have said that that the, the foyers of our churches are places of slaughter. You know, we we the, the devil looks for the mouth that blesses and curses. So we we bless the Lord through praise and, and honor and worship at mass. We receive our Lord on our tongues. Then we walk out and we completely commit spiritual murder, you know, by by, by detracting against our neighbor. Uh, um, and or, or, or slamming the priest for that terrible homily and or whatever. We have to be very, very careful because the devil's looking for that, that inconsistency. So catechism 2475 to 2487, take a look at that and do it. That's a good, again, a good examination of conscience. The last thing, number five, you, a good, another phrase, like another Clementine phrase, this, the demon enters through sin and holds through heresy. Explain the connection between heresy and uh, entry points and diabolic uh, holding points in cases of, of oppression. So this holding point, this attachment is going to be some lie, some falsehood or ignorance that the human and the fallen angel, the demon share. Uh, the, the demon knows the truth, but he wants to push this because this is his leverage. This is the talking point, if you will, uh, a point of psychological compatibility between the demon and the human. And so an example of this is that in each and every possession case we've had, there's been at least one defective Marian dogma. There's been one dogmatic truth about the Blessed Mother that the person either doubted or disbelieved. And so that's why we we use the word heresy, meaning as an untruth, not a uh, perhaps a canonical heresy, but an untruth, a falsehood, or um, a, a failure to understand that it's an article of the faith. These are the points where the demon and the human are psychologically compatible. And when you identify those, then it's up to the human to correct these defects, thereby uh, severing the communication on this topic with the demon. So let's summarize, Kyle. Big points. They all kind of go work in together. Violations of the First Commandment, occult activity, deviant sexual behavior, sexual immorality, unforgiveness, 
detractions and offenses against the truth, and finally, heresy. These are the holding points of the diabolic. So the, what is the antidote? This is why uh, uh, um, Saint, or Father, Father Amor says that the Virgin Mary is the antidote to Satan in our times. So she is she is a pure worship. She, she, is, she, she is the answer. Let's go back to her. Let's continue to go back to Our Lady. So we thank you for listening in today. Kyle, thanks for coming on. I'm, uh, uh, we'll see you hopefully next week together. Uh, tune in, tune in for the next program. I think Gary Machu is next, and then the Terry and Jesse show. Again, thank you for coming in. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Stay holy, get holy, or die trying. <laughs>